Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Okay, doing well. I like it. I like it. Well, it is great to be with you. My name is Ryan Clement, and I'm one of the pastors on staff here. And uh, it is always an honor to get to share the Word of God with you. Uh, probably one of my favorite things to get to do in my life. And so thank you so much for being here uh, in person, out on the patio, watching online, even watching back later. It is just great to have you. So thank you for making this a priority. Um, I was reflecting on what we do with sermons this week as I was writing this sermon and just thinking about how we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, that this is given through God's various messengers who wrote it, and it is for both the time it was written as well as present day and as well as future. And we believe that the Holy Spirit of God speaks God's word to us. And the role of this sermon here, at least for this morning, is to both understand what the words meant when they were first written and then what God might mean for them today. And sometimes that's the same and sometimes that's new and that's fresh. And one of the things I love about God is God can speak the same scripture that maybe we have come to be very familiar with in a new way, in a fresh way. And so it is my hope for this morning as we come through, we walk through a relatively familiar passage that maybe we get a little bit different perspective on it this morning than maybe we've gotten before in the past. And I love how the Holy Spirit loves to give different enlightenment and understanding to God's word in different seasons that we go through and that God ministers to us in various ways. I was reflecting on uh, an experience I had when I was... Uh, a senior in high school and a, a freshman in college. I got in, into video production. My dad had one of those VHS camcorders as a kid, and we always filmed family movies around Christmas, and we would get together with the extended family and show our different videos. And my dad would edit different things, and so I think that kind of sparked my love for film. And when my parents said that I had to go to college, um, I said, okay, that's fine, but I'm gonna study making movies. So I did that, I was a film major in college. Um, but in high school, I got into making video um, projects and for every class, I would just ask the teacher, can this be a video project? Can this be? Now this is when the technology was not so great, okay? They had just gone from VHS to mini DV, if you have any idea what that is. Anybody know what mini DV is? Okay, all four of us, okay, great. <laughs> I become one of those people I swore and I would never be. Back in my day, you know, mini DV. And so um, we would film, and it was cool. My Spanish class, my English class, history, science, whatever it was, we'd film movies. And um, it was just much easier than writing papers, and so I really enjoyed that. And so we would borrow our friend's dad's cameras who filmed for different sports games. And uh, one day, uh, our friend's dad was basically um, in a wedding, but his brother-in-law wanted it to be filmed, so he asked if we could film it. We filmed it there, and then the photographer there liked us and decided to hire us for a few more weddings, and we started a business. So by my senior in high school, we started this business, and we were filming weddings, and we started doing bridal shows. You should have seen me. I was like 18 years old with my best friend, who's also a pastor now. Um, he was 17, and we're at like these bridal shows at these big conventions. We're like all dressed up, and we're like promoting our business. And our very first bridal show, I'll never forget, I did not sleep before. So for the 72 hours, three-day period, I probably slept an hour and a half each night. And I was exhausted. We were printing our own brochures, burning DVDs. Does anybody remember what DVDs are? Okay, a few of us. Okay. Burning DVDs and stuffing them in these, we had like 200 brochures and we building this booth for this, it was crazy. The bridal show went great on the way home. The second light before I got to my house, I remember being woken up. Ryan, the light's green. And then we drove home. And I was so exhausted. I don't think I've ever been more exhausted in my life. And so I was home safe. It's not a story of like how I almost died. But it is a story of how I tend to live my life. And that is I go hard, I run hard, I work hard, and then I crash. And that's just how I've always lived. My parents would always say growing up, Ryan, you burn the candle at both ends and in the middle, and sometimes you just throw it in the fire. And that's just how I've always lived. I've just always been go, 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 and then I'm exhausted, and I'm recovering for days. And I just have always struggled to know how to rest. Like, how do you just sit still? You know, how do you just stay there? 
Um, if I were active on Facebook, which I'm not that active anymore, and Rest had its own profile, I'd be in a relationship status with Rest, and it would be marked, it's complicated. So I know that joke's about 10 years too late, but that's just kind of, you know, what my relationship is. And so I have learned a lot over the years of how much I need to rest and I need to prioritize rest. And I've learned a lot that I need to put rest first, not as this somehow like deserved reward that once I get all my work done and once everything is complete, then I can finally take a break. So we're going to be talking this morning about Sabbath, about the biblical principle of regular, scheduled, disciplined rest. And we're going to be looking at Psalm 23. Now, Psalm 23 is a psalm that Pastor Juno preached just a few weeks ago, and so I'm hoping that this is a different enough take, that it doesn't just feel repetitive, and I'm really going to preach on Psalm 23 through the context of Sabbath and rest, and you'll understand that a little bit more as we move forward. So while my wife and I were away in Maui a few weeks ago, um, we just had a great, great time, and we approach rest in a few different ways. Number one... Uh, recreational rest. We love to just lay out on the beach. We love to go eat some yummy food. We did lots of snorkeling with turtles and various fish. And we did it at a slow pace because most of our life is go, go, go. I'm trying to do 25 things in 14 minutes. That's what life feels like. But we intentionally walked to our car a little slower, right? We intentionally drove a little slower. The speed limits there are already a lot lower. But we drove a little slower. We, we actually could taste the food we were eating. Normally, it's just like, don't fight with your brother. Finish your food. Please sit at the table. Oh, did I even eat? I guess it's gone, right? It's just so fast. And so we enjoyed our food. We just were at a slower pace. It was restful, and it was enjoyable. And we also took some time to talk and read and pray about Sabbath. One of the books I was reading talked about Sabbath and regular rest. And the author said, every Saturday... For a 24-hour period, his whole family takes a break and doesn't do any work. And my heart just sank because I was like, this is something I deeply long for and feel like I can never have. And so I talked to Hartley and I just said, I would love a day off. I just would love a day of rest. But we just seem to always have too much to do. So we've been really intentional since we've gotten back to really prioritize practicing Sabbath one day a week. Now, let's go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. And uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to that. If you have the app, you can do that as well, or you can check it out on the screen. This is the Ten Commandments. This is also known as the Ten Words or the Decalogue. This is where Moses brings the Ten Commandments. And here's what's going on. The Israelites have been growing as a family, a large family, in Egypt for hundreds of years. They started out in favor. They were welcomed in during famine and blessed and given provisions. But over time, as the rulers changed, they became slaves. And it got worse and worse and worse until God used Moses to let his people go. And so the Israelites get rescued from slavery, and God is bringing them from Egypt into a land that he has promised them. And along the way, God is very intentional to form them and develop them into the people. God rescues them from Pharaoh and says, you will now be my people, okay? And I will be your God, and you will follow my laws. And I love the Ten Commandments. I love all of Scripture. But I love that God commands rest, You just see the love and the mercy and the graciousness of God telling his people that they are required to take a break and to keep the Sabbath day holy. This is what Exodus chapter 20 verse 8 says in the Ten Commandments section um, about Sabbath. It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Remember the term holy means to be set apart, special, significant. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And so I love that it's very likely that the Israelites were working very hard seven days a week in Egypt. 
and God rescues them out. And part of what he says is you need to take a day off every week. Six days you shall do your work, and one day shall be a rest. And it's not just for you. It's for everyone in your home, everyone in your community, even guests, like out-of-town guests. They need to rest, too. Like, they're not allowed to work. That's how serious this is. And I love that it's not just not working, but it's remembering who God is. It's being reminded of how God has provided, reminded of how God is faithful, And it's really just a resettling and a refocusing on the goodness of God because life gets busy and crazy and we get out of whack and distracted and we need a day to come back together. So Sabbath is meant to be a break from work and a reminder of who God is and enjoying his presence as if it were enough. Now, Sabbath could be a whole sermon series for 10 weeks. I took a 10-week seminary class on Sabbath economics, and that was awesome. And so I have so much to say about Sabbath, but I want to get to Psalm 23 today. And so very quickly, I will say that Sabbath is not just a day of rest, but biblically, it is also a principle that is multiplied. And what I mean by that is that every seventh year, um, the Israelites were required to not plant anything in their fields. They had to let their fields rest every seventh year. And what's really cool is it says whatever naturally grew was for the poor and was for the homeless and for those who didn't have food. And so we see God's provision for the needy even in his de- design for rest. Every seventh seventh year, seven times seven is 49, so every 50th year was a jubilee. All debt was erased. All prisoners were freed and let go, and it was a a year off, a whole year celebration. Um, Anyone who was uh, sold into slavery of any type, uh, they were were guaranteed freedom by the seventh year. So there was no this lifelong thing going on. There was freedom. Um, And so Sabbath is... It's a lifestyle. It's a habit. It's not just a day off a week, but it's a year off and things like that. Throughout history, all sorts of people have practiced Sabbath very differently. Uh, My wife and I are enjoying the end of The Chosen Season 2. I know we're a little behind, uh, but we're really enjoying The Chosen. If you haven't seen it, definitely check it out. It has its own app that you can watch it on. Uh, So much of the criticism that Jesus receives is because he's doing things on the Sabbath, even like healing people. And so you see the Pharisees frustrated because he's breaking these laws. And Jesus responds by saying, if your animal fell into a ditch on the Sabbath, would you not rescue it? Right? And so he kind of redirects their view of Sabbath. But we see that it was believed that you you could do no work. I had a friend tell me that growing up, uh, he wasn't allowed to swim on Sundays, even when the summer was so hot, because that was considered work. And until one summer when it was so excruciatingly hot, that rule kind of changed, and then they could all swim. And so it's interesting to see if you study different people and cultures and denominations, people have approached Sabbath very differently. There's a whole debate on is it Saturday, is it Sunday, is it Tuesday, right? There's all sorts of things. The key things I want you to understand about Sabbath that we prioritize and practice today, number one, it's a day off, it's a day of rest. Don't do any work. It can be whatever day of the week you want. We, we don't think that there's like this very specific day. For my family, we're trying to practice Friday at 6 p.m. to Saturday at 6 p.m. And for our Sabbath day yesterday, the kitchen, which is my responsibility, was piling with dishes and it smelled so bad that we had to close the doors. I'm sorry I disclosed that. <laughs> I'm going to get busted later, baby. But um, we just had to say... It's Sabbath day. We are blocking it out. There is so much work to be done, but we are taking a break. And I think we're really glad that we did as a family. So since Maui, we've been really intentional to to take a Sabbath day every week, Friday at 6 to Saturday at 6. So it's whatever time works for you. And for us, we're, we're, we're trying not to clean, we're trying not to plan or organize or do any manual labor or anything like that. We're just trying to take a break. And when the kids are awake, that means playing with them, eating, playing outside, trying to read, even though we're interrupted every three minutes with he hit me, she hit me, blah, blah, blah. And when the kids are asleep, it means journaling, praying, reading, reflecting, things like that. And so what about you? What about your life? Could you use some rest? Could you use some time off? Could you use a break from that never-ending to-do list? I read a little bit of an article this week that said that 
many Americans are trapped in this vicious cycle of this never-ending to-do list, and they are stressed out, and they are burned out, and they are overworked, and they don't know how to get out of it and how to escape. There's always more to be done, always more to be achieved. And so Sabbath is really, really important and a very important priority. And I just want to encourage you, find a time in your week where you can take a legitimate break Find a time, maybe it's four hours, maybe it's eight hours. Start somewhere and take that break. Sabbath, too, is one of those things that um, is really about pausing and and seeking the Lord. The funny thing about rest is I feel more tired when I rest. You know what I mean? Like, when I'm going really, really fast, it's like I'm doing too much to realize how tired I really am. But when I finally take a break and rest, I realize I'm really tired. And I just need a nap. And that's okay. Sometimes you just need a nap. But taking that time to rest is really, really important. Uh, Pastor Juno taught me something that was really helpful. And it extends Sabbath beyond the weekly rhythm. And that is divert daily, withdraw weekly, and abandon annually. So daily we need to find, even if it's a five or ten minute break, to stop from what we're doing and to just seek the Lord in prayer and scripture and to just invite his presence into our life. Every day. Maybe it's when we get up in the morning or before we go to bed or both or at our lunch break or whatever it is. We need that daily. Weekly, we need that withdrawal where we can have that Sabbath day and abandon annually. We need at least a week every year where we can just get away from our home, get away from the to-dos and rest. That's not like a week of projects. It's a week of taking a break. It's a Sabbath lifestyle. And so that's something that as a family, we're really working hard at, at trying to do. So I want to walk through Psalm 23 now in the context of Sabbath, in the context of trying to have intentional days of rest, and I want to walk through this psalm. One more note about Sabbath, I would say binge-watching TV and social media scrolling is not helpful for Sabbath. And I don't want to make that as like a blanket statement on everyone, but I know for me, it's not helpful. When I am so tired and burned out, I have these habits that I go to that help me veg and kind of check out. It helps me take a break from the stress that I'm feeling, but it doesn't restore my soul like the Lord's presence. So when I talk about Sabbath, I'm not just talking about vegging. I'm talking about intentional rest. And sometimes for me, that looks like going on a bike ride, even though that's an activity, It's a time where I can listen to a podcast or be prayerful or just get out and do some things. And sometimes that's sitting and reading a book. And for some of us, it might be gardening. That might be a Sabbath activity. And for some of us, that is work, and I will never be doing that on Sabbath, right? And um, so I think it, it just takes some prayer and discernment of what is truly restful and what is truly leading us back to prioritize God. So we're going to jump into Psalm 23. Uh, You may recognize this. It's probably one of the most famous psalms, as well as some of the most famous scripture, often read at funerals and things like that. And so if you have uh, your app or your Bible, you can follow along there, or it'll be on the screen. We're going to go one verse at a time, and I want to walk you through with some theological insight, as well as what it was like for me to just read through this psalm. I read through this psalm a few weeks ago, as the beginning of my Sabbath day and inviting God to help me slow down sort of that freeway off-ramp feel where my week has been crazy and it just takes a little time to kind of wind down. And so Psalm 23 was my off-ramp to begin my Sabbath day. It starts like this in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Some translations say that I shall have no want. The image of God being a shepherd is like one who cares for his sheep. And the rest of the psalm talks about the ways that the shepherd cares for his sheep. So upon reading this, initiating Sabbath, I thought, God, you are my shepherd. You care for me. You love me. You protect me. You want the best for me. Thank you that you are leading me, God, and guiding me. Because like a dumb sheep, I often act in ways that are not in my best interest. So God, thank you that you are leading me and guiding me. I lack nothing. The Hebrew here really talks about the idea that all of our necessities are met. So it doesn't mean we are going to get whatever we want or feel like, but it means it's an acknowledgement that God provides us for 
what we need in order to live. And so in God's presence, we are reminded of all the ways that God has provided for us. So for me, on that night as I was practicing Sabbath, I took some time to pray and thank God for all the things he had given me that week and in my life and has blessed me with. And as I recalled those things, it's just funny how that list grows more and more and more and more. And as I take time to reflect on the blessings I have, I'm reminded that, wow, God really has provided so much for me to be grateful for. It's also a reminder that God provides for my needs moving forward in the future. That whatever worries I might have coming up, I know that God has my best interest in mind. And so I can prayerfully surrender those things to him and invite God's presence. And it's also a reminder that God's presence is enough. That God's presence is the only thing that can truly satisfy my soul more than anything else. Verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. Now, the Hebrew rendering here for uh, he makes me lie down uh, is not a forceful lie down. This isn't like a get down, sheep, you know. This is a guided lie down. And I just appreciate the language here because I would not choose rest if it was not commanded. And that's an honest confession that I've shared earlier in this sermon. But because God commands rest, it's out of love and obedience to him that I prioritize that rest with him that I make Sabbath a priority in my life and my family's life. And so I so appreciate that God, as the good shepherd, makes us, guides us to lie down and rest and take a break, to lie down in green pastures. The language here for green pastures is like fresh, new green grass, which is comfortable to rest on, which is great for eating. God provides a restful place for us. And he leads me beside quiet waters. The word there for quiet actually means peaceful, peaceful waters. Waters that are safe from predators or from enemies. Waters that are safe from dangers. Waters that you can trust, that you can spend time in and be nourished. Like the sheep coming beside the peaceful waters. There's no worry that a predator is coming around. There's no worry about what else is going on because God is taking care of things. And again, in the Hebrew, this is in both the present and future tense, which means in this moment, God is bringing us to green pastures and peaceful waters. And in the future, he desires to lead us to the same. It doesn't mean we're never going to go through hardship. It doesn't mean we're never going to go through trial or things that are so difficult or seasons that are so stressful, but it means that God desires to bring us to these quiet, still, peaceful waters and green pastures. And so as I read this verse, I reflected on my last week, and I reflected on that moment in my future and God's desire to bring me to that peaceful place. Verse 3, he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Sabbath is a blessing, and it refreshes our soul. I love this word here for refreshing, too, because it also includes repentance. And that's something you might not see in just the language here, but the word here includes confession of sin. That not only does God's presence fill us and nourish us in a special way, But it's a safe space to confess our sins for where we've gotten off track, for where we've lost sight, for where we've made mistakes that week. So as I read through this psalm, I took time to confess my sins from the week. A lot of times I think as Christians we just get so used to the idea that Jesus has forgiven us and we have God's grace and so we just make mistakes and and commit a sin and just kind of move on and, and don't dwell on it much. But we need to be intentional to say, God, I have messed up. I am sorry. Would you forgive me? Knowing we have forgiveness immediately and not just forgiveness but restoration. That God restores us. He refreshes our soul. His presence is what we most long for. He guides me along the right paths. Not only does he restore us, but he's intentionally guiding us to do what is right and good. God knows the directions that we need in our life. He knows where we need to go. We often want to go our own way. We often think we know the best way, but it's important that we pause. And in this moment, I pause and said, God, I have some plans for my week, for my month, and for my year and beyond. 
But God, you guide my paths. You direct my steps. You show me where you need me to go. You show me what you need me to do because I want to walk with you and follow you. Jesus said, I do what I see the Father doing. And he was so in tune with what God the Father was doing. I want that for me. I want that for us. It says he guides us in the right paths for his name's sake. And what that means is God's very character draws us to do what is good and what is right. It's consistent with who he is that we would live a life honoring to him. It also means that God is trustworthy that we can trust him. And this has also been known as a psalm of trust, that God is the good shepherd who has the best of intentions for us. And we can really trust him. We can trust where he's leading us and guiding us and what he has for us because we know he is good and has our best interest in mind. And then verse four, probably one of the most famous verses in this psalm. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Other translations call this the shadow of of death, the, the darkness. But the language here really means the darkest valley. It means so dark that you can't see your hand in front of your face. It is that dark. And so this is saying even when we walk through our darkest valleys, the most difficult seasons in our life, we will not be afraid of anything. Because God is with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. The rod and the staff are interesting. The rod was used to beat up any animals that threatened the sheep. It was a protection. So the good shepherd had a rod to beat off any animals that threatened the life of their sheep. And the staff was used to gently guide the sheep in the right direction. You get a little tap on the right when you need to go to the left and vice versa. Your rod and your staff comfort me means that God is both protecting us and guiding us, even in our darkest valleys, when we can't see anything going on, but we can trust. So whatever season we are going through, whatever uncertainty we have, whatever pain or fear, we know that God is with us. We know that we can trust him. Sabbath is a reminder that in anything that we're going through, God's with us. When I'm hustling to get the kids ready for school and get myself to work and I've had a long work day and then I come back and it's making dinner and then it's putting everything away and cleaning up and getting the kids ready for bed and it's just so busy day after day after day. Sometimes it's hard to take time to pause and be reminded of God's goodness, but I need to do that much more. And the psalm is a reminder that God is with us in every season. One of the practices that I've done from time to time and have been taught to do is to give God thanks for everything you do, even in your day. God, thank you that I could wake up. Thank you that we have food to eat. Thank you that we have clothes to wear and a home. Thank you for my family. Thank you for vehicles to take them to school. Thank you for education and for teachers. Thank you for the blessings you've given me. Thank you for work. Thank you for provision. Thank you for rest. Thank you, and just thank God throughout my day. And that really helps me to live a life of gratitude. Verse 5 says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. It's a continuation of the deep, darkest valley theme that even if our enemies are pressing in or whatever is challenging us or threatening us or going against us or whatever difficult hurdles we have ahead or challenging things we are going through, God has time to sit and provide for us the sustenance we need. The cup overflowing is a symbol that there's plenty of food at the table, that we have more than we need. We have enough. The anointing of the head is the sign of honor that not only is God with us, but he blesses us, he anoints us, he cares for us. And verse 6 says, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I love this verse. There is this confidence that God's goodness 
and his love will be with us every single day in our life. And forever will we dwell with him. There's this proclamation that says we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And it's both a recognition that God has included us in Christ into his family forever and nothing can take that away. And both a res- also a response to say I will forever be in God's family. I will forever be in his house. I will forever be his beloved child. And nothing can take that away. And it is this confidence that ends and concludes this psalm of trust, that we can trust God for all eternity, that he is with us and that he cares for us. So as I read this psalm through to initiate my Sabbath, I stopped after every verse reflecting and praying through my life. And it really helped me to really connect with God and be reminded of what Sabbath is. And so my challenge for us this week is for all of us to be intentional to practice Sabbath at some point this week and to be intentional to start it by reading through and praying through Psalm 23. Now, for some of us, we got plenty of time on our hands. It feels like we're doing a lot of Sabbath a lot of days. But what would it look like to be more intentional with drawing near to the Lord in a special period of time? For others of us, getting just 15 minutes to focus in on this kind of stuff just seems out of reach. And so whatever it looks like in your life, would you take some time to do a little more than maybe you are used to doing? And this week that for our family, our kids are going back to school. Our kids, we have to be out of the house by 7 a.m. to get them to school on time. This is the wrong week to start a new habit of rest. Hello, there's too much going on, but it's the perfect week. It's the week that we need and that God has commanded for us. And so I want to encourage us to read through Psalm 23 and take some time to reflect on this, um, this passage and this psalm as we practice Sabbath. And so in closing, I want to read through Psalm 23 just one more time. And I want you all to close your eyes as I read this over you. And I want you to feel free to say a prayer in your own mind ahead, as anything comes to mind as we're reading this. I'm going to read it slowly, and I'm going to leave a little pause after each verse as just a way of praying this and reading this over you. And I just want you to, in whatever way you need to, invite God into whatever you're going through in your life or whatever you need uh, to share. Let me pray. Or let me read this Psalm 23 over us. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let me pray for us. Father, you are so good and so faithful, the loving and caring and good shepherd who guides us and leads us to rest. Lord, we just confess the ways that we have not prioritized your presence and we have probably burned out beyond acknowledgement of your goodness, wondering where you are, struggling with things in life and faith, but not taking the time to rest and acknowledge you and just sit with you. So many of your blessings come through seasons of rest, God, and times of rest. God, and we just pray for that rejuvenation, even right now in this moment, for supernatural peace and rest, Lord. We pray for this week. Some of us, it's going to be really busy. 
Lord, we just pray that we would be able to prioritize Sabbath, God, that you would meet us there, that you would rejuvenate and refresh our soul beyond our own ability, God. We pray for your presence and your favor, your blessing, your grace, God. We just say that we love you, Lord. We need you. We're so grateful for you and so grateful for your word, God. And all God's people said, amen.